I have risen from the f***ing <laughs> ashes like a phoenix. <laughs> You know, moving forward, are you nervous about slipping up? No, I'm not, because every time I got out of treatment, I already knew that I was going to go right back to it. And I already knew that I wanted to do it, knowing that it's bad because I didn't have any reason to not. Yeah. Now that I have skating back, I don't want to screw that up. I don't want to screw up yeah. my relationship with Danny because if I even relapse once, my dick will be chopped off, it'll be thrown <laughs> in the river, and she'll be long gone. Don't it. need that. And for the sake of my son, Phoenix, who's six years old, Yeah. He's the main reason. You've overcome a lot, man. There's like so many different heroes' journeys in your story. Mm. And I know it's inspired a lot of people. Now I want to prove to myself and to the people that if you lost hope and you don't think that you can change or get better, it's never too late. Rock and roll. Bam Margera. How you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, man. Man, so uh, thanks for coming out on short notice. Uh, I was told we had the opportunity to interview you, and I was like, man, hell yeah, that would be uh, incredible. So thanks for coming by. Yeah, I mean, we've been, <laughs> ever since I met uh, my girlfriend, Danny, she's a stretch coach. We've been on the road for the past eight months, maybe home Philadelphia, Castle Bam for like less than a week. But all, all in all, we've been traveling in a purple Bentley with two dogs, <laughs> and we've been to pretty much at least 12 states by now. <laughs> what have you been doing uh, traveling? Um. Well, now that, see, this is what happened. In 2013, I gave up all hope because the doctor officially said my legs were like dry rotted rubber bands from <laughs> alcohol abuse and good luck trying to skateboard again, which made me leave with a fucking Gatorade and vodka and it only made me drink more. Mm -hmm. So at 250 pounds, I was just, I fucking gave the fuck. <laughs> or can you cuss? Oh, yeah. I, okay. right. So I gave up. And, um, and then when I met her, she said, I'm a stretch coach and I will stretch you an hour a day and do don't listen to him. You'll be able to skate again. And all it took was like a month of every day. I started to like mega notice. And then once I started skateboarding again, I instantly got my muscle memory back, which I haven't got back in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So now my passion is back to skateboard. All I want to do is that. So, um, I was having an issue with my house. I kind of leased it to my brother because I did the longest Florida shuffle two years, which if you don't know what this is, it means that when an interventionist knows that you have good insurance, they will find reasons to keep you in treatment for eternity. So when I got out, he still had a couple months of, of living in there. So I was like, let's just hit the road and go from skate spot to skate spot, visit friends and she saves dogs. So <laughs> there's been quite a few times where I was at the skate park. She'd see an abandoned dog across the street and go rescue it. Oh, awesome. Meaning like put it in a shelter or dogs in shelters. She finds homes for. So how long have you been back uh, skating? Um, I've been back for a solid eight <laughs> months now. Yeah, um, I was kind of forced to take... It's funny because when Jackass 4 was happening, I signed a contract that they wanted me off alcohol and Adderall, which I've been prescribed to for 13 years. When I go into treatments, which I had to pay for, they put me on 18 different medications, like by propion, propanolol, Zyprexa, Latuda, Lithium, um, Trazodone, Seroquel, everything you could imagine to the point where I couldn't even cry or come. Like I had no <laughs> emotions whatsoever. And there's all the side effects left, left the stiff muscles. So I couldn't skate weight gain. So I extra couldn't skate. I was top heavy and off balance. And who, who wants to basically try any trick over a pyramid holding two 20 pound weights in your hand? if not more. And when I left, I was 250, but it all left a weight gain, stiff muscles, erectile dysfunction, hair loss, and suicidal tendencies, which I was getting. And if I stop taking the medication, then I don't get the $5 million for the movie that I usually get. So when I stopped taking it, they're like, you stopped taking your medication, you broke your contract. Yeah, what's the point of getting $5 million if I'm dead? Yeah. <laughs> well, so you've been, uh, you got out of rehab, what, you said eight months ago? Yeah. So you started skating, you got off like uh, certain meds. Um, what's it been like being sober and getting back, you know, back into it? Um, the only thing that I had overcome is um, boredom. When, mm. when, when I'm bored, I look across the street, I see an Irish pub and people cracking jokes. And I'm like, I'll just do that all day. Mm -hmm. So when I cured <clears throat> boredom, Danny has showed me structure, which 
treatments they, treatments have their own way and it doesn't work for me it might work for other people hallelujah but not for me i needed all i needed was structure i need to wake up knowing that i'm walking the dogs today and if they don't eat then i don't eat and if i'm hungry i better feed them you know like having these two dogs like it it makes me have something to take care of because at one point i couldn't even take care of myself then we would stretch then i would find a skate spot i would skate she would take the photo I've taught her to be a professional thrasher photographer, believe me. That's awesome. <laughs> and then when we're done that, then I usually, we find like antique stores we like that, or, you know, like old fashioned jewelry, vintage clothes, mom and pop coffee shops, waterfalls, beautiful scenery, hiking, and then we get some dinner and I either paint, read, or write, or whatever, or watch Dateline. Right. But I need a structured schedule knowing that I'm going, <laughs> as soon as she got me in bed, it was like 10 o'clock, I'm like, Man, you have tamed the Impala. It's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you've tamed the Impala. Why? How, what, what do you mean? You have me in bed at 10. This is unbelievable. <laughs> because I never had a boss. I never had a nine to five. I never had anybody tell me what to do. And I never had any place to be. So if I'm super into editing, I'll edit till the sun comes up. If I'm super into partying, I'll party till the sun comes up. If I'm super interested in painting a picture, I'll do it till the sun comes up. Never had a structured schedule knowing that if I don't go to bed now, then it's going to interrupt the flow of my whole next day. Now, what's it like, you know, cause I had a opiate addiction years ago from fighting. I was a uh, professional fighter and, and trained <clears throat> professional fighters. And so I was about two years uh, of taking opiates prescribed and, you know, went through the withdrawal issues and I uh, did Ibogaine actually in um, Mexico uh, and, been clean now for gosh 15 years or so um but you know to me it was like my head was kind of out of a out of a cloud all of a sudden yeah um is you know i know that you, they had you on a lot of different meds what's it like now you know six months eight months sober uh, yeah. when, you, when you look at things i would i would say that um it was really scary because i was always so used to showing up whether it's a nightclub or even a buddy's house already drunk or already sipping on a beer and that was my comfort zone and like if you weren't drinking with me i would feel weird and if nobody was drinking i would even feel more weird but as soon as i overcome you know just because i always want people to feel comfortable and i always think that if you give somebody a beer or a drink then they loosen up and they get more comfortable and when there's no beer like people would offer me tea i'm like tea are you kidding me no i don't need a cup of tea i'm going to drink it in 5 seconds it's this big and there's no alcohol in it you know yeah. but um now that i can see clearly i think for a while i had so many terrible things going on in mm -hmm. my life that i didn't want to remember yeah you know what I mean? Like when you're in five different lawsuits and you have to hire Donald Trump's lawyer to get you out of a pickle with your family, then I say I'll put a bear trap on your foot knowing that I don't own one and it's a terroristic death threat charge that I have to pay a lot of money to defend myself. You know I don't have a bear trap. And even I put my hand in, in one in Jackass 2 and it didn't even break, so cool your jetpack. <laughs> and then on top of that, I had custody battle and then another one, some idiot showed up at my house when I was at a Post Malone concert and did a drunken wheelie into my ex-wife's Range Rover and he's suing me because apparently I let him in drunk and let him do that. No, I don't know who you are. I have a gate. I don't know who let you in, but your idiot ass grabbed my motorcycle without asking and did a wheelie into my ex-wife's Range Rover. If anything, you should be paying for the damage of her car. But no, it's been an ongoing lawsuit. Then on top of that, I had three credit cards, and I guess the max of them is 25 grand because... One person was a, a psychic gypsy healer lady who found out my credit card. I said, you can pay for gas for this one thing. She racked up 25 grand at like Walgreens and Best Buy and whatever. And then, I, and then a stripper stole my other one and she racked up 20 grand at a nightclub in one night, which I, I think is impossible. <laughs> How do you do that? Don't know who that car is, but valet it. Don't know who that car is, but valet it. Those guys, those guys, those guys, just give them bottle service. How do you rack up 20 grand in a nightclub? Then my next credit card was a good friend in a band called 616 who has an alcohol problem. I told him he could pay for his bill at Sun Studios for four grand with my card. So when I gave it to him, he gets all Larry to fuck up and buys $20,000 worth of sunglasses and jackets. <laughs> I'm like, fuck it. Come on. Can it get any worse? So I checked into the Sunset Marquee. 
ready to check out, if you know what I mean. I bought a whole bunch of drugs, and I was, I did not care if I would wake up the next day. And I'm like, if I wake up, fuck. And if I do, God, you better provide me the hottest eye candy with a tan pit bull and A cup tits. <laughs> because all my girlfriend Fryer, they'd always talk me into getting them boobs. It would always be rock hard. They say they'll sell down in a year. And then a year will go by. I'm like, they're still rock hard. Don't even want to do nothing except titty fuck your butt cheeks. <laughs> so when I woke up, I was like, shit, I'm alive. <laughs> go out to the pool area, sip on a um Bloody Mary and I overhear a girl uh, saying, listen, I'm 43. I'm, I'm Sicilian and Irish, born in New Jersey. I'm like, I was born in Philly. I'm Sicilian and Irish. I'm 43. I'm like, who are you? She's like, I'm a stretch coach. I'm like, get over here. That's exactly what I need. We hit it off big time. And then after talking for a while, she's like, I got to go walk my dogs. I'm like, dogs? What kind of dogs? She's like, I got a tan pit bull. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, so Michael the Archangel shot down the fucking hottest girl to save my life. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That was the catalyst. It was. So what was it like you, you met yeah, your, your girlfriend and then you went to rehab like directly after Did she helped you get yeah, in? Yeah, well, was what happened was when we met, met in Los Angeles, we really hit it off and we're spending every day together. And I told her that I had to go back to Pennsylvania for a court case and I don't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So she flew with me left the dogs in a kennel, left the Bentley at the LAX parking lot, thinking that we'd be right back. Well, they sentenced me to not be able to leave the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm like, Your Honor, I live in Los Angeles now with her. We have two dogs boarded up and my car's parked at the airport. He's like, ain't my problem. I'm like, yeah, it's my problem. And it's a huge one. Not to mention, I leased my Castle Bam out to my brother, so I can't even go home. So what do you want me to do? Just float around Pennsylvania fucking Motel 6s near the fucking airport? You know, like, ain't my problem. Like, why can't I? My home is now L.A. Yeah. But, you know, we made the best of it. And then that's when um, Ed Duff, the skateboarder, he rides for Tony Hawk's company, Birdhouse. He, uh, his parents, Pamela and Ed, uh, Edward, uh, own Duff Electric, which powers like 10% of Philadelphia or whatever. So they got 90 acres of property, all these properties around the Bucks County area. And um, let us live in this really cool... Um, greenhouse with all these crystals plants and uh sauna hot tub uh ice pool it's, it's great yeah, i love it and um once i got my house back we didn't even want to go back i'm like let's just stay up here at the doves this is great it's in the middle of nowhere nobody bothers us there's 10 jackasses <laughs> if i feed carrots two in the morning That's awesome. <laughs> yeah and so you've been there for the last eight months so you, you actually didn't go to rehab you went straight to the no, oh no so is what happened was when they sent me to philadelphia they also said that i had to do eight days in a detox or something when I think I had a beer two days prior, I, I forget what happened, but when I checked in the detox, they were like, so what do you detox it off? Most people are like, years and years of heroin, and, and they sleep for a month. I'm like, a beer. <laughs> they're like, when? I'm like, last Wednesday. They're like, and that's it? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, what are you even doing here? I'm like, they're making me. I don't know. Well, how many days of detox do you gonna think you're going to go through in that room? None. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole thing was dumb, but she, I, Danny flew back out, grabbed the dogs, grabbed the Bentley out of the airport, and had started heading my way, and we met just in the nick of time of me getting out. And then from there, we decided to just hit the road to get away from people that are after me. Like, my guardian at Lightum, Lima, she was after me. Any little... She was like basically praying that I would relapse just so she could put me back to another treatment center. I don't know if she's getting kickbacks or, or some kind of benefit from this, but I went to 13 different fucking places in Florida at 90 days a piece, not to mention 200 days in Tucson, Arizona. It's like her answer to anything is rehab, rehab, constantly rehab and put them on all this fucking shit. As soon as I got out, I'm on nothing. I've never been more happy in my life because skateboarding is my medicine and pussy me. <laughs> so where, where all have you gone to in that last six months? So we went from Philly, drove down to Florida to do either Comic Cons or Hard Cons or just look for skate spots or skate friends all day. So mm -hmm. we went down there to Orlando. From there, we went to New Orleans. And then when we got to Texas, I had to do another Comic Con. And then we met Black Rifle Coffee Company, Jared, which 
I'm really into because people like Bucky Lasik and Travis Pastrana rod for him, and they help the military because uh, he's a veteran. Yep. So um, I get to his house. There's <clears> skate ramps everywhere. There's an editing system, a music studio, a backyard pool, ice plunge on. I'm like, hell yeah. So we posted up there for like two months until we made our way. Uh, to Matt Hoffman's house, had to do another Comic-Con in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then we floated back to her hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, and hung out with her sister and mom in the Atlanta area. And then Philly, now back here. Now the mission continues because I have another Comic-Con in Corpus Christi, Texas. Then we go back home, San Juan, Puerto Rico, back home, Florida, back home, then Ireland. <laughs> wow. That's a hell of a schedule. Yeah. And but it's fun. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're having fun, you know. Right. If, if you're like dreading the whole thing, then why bother? But no, we've been having a blast. We've seen everything. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's the thing about work. It's not really work if uh, if you're having a great time. True. If you're enjoying it. And, and I've learned to really at, at first, you know, my manager would be like, "Babe, you want to make twenty grand for an appearance?" I'm like, "No." He's like, it's just an hour of signing stuff. You don't want to make 20 grand in one hour? I'm like, no. He's like, he's like why? I'm like, because I don't want to appear anywhere. I'm 250 pounds. <laughs> I look like shit. I don't need everybody in line saying, what happened to you? <laughs> you know, and I got a secret beer under the fucking table. <clears throat> no. But now, you know, I'm happy skating again. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I'm happy who I'm with. I'm, I'm stoked to do the signings, you know, because... I'm in a good mood. <laughs> yeah, you're in a good place. What's uh, what's the goal, man? Like, so you know, you're you're like a, you know, it's like a a second life or another life. Um, what's what's the what's like? The goal I is? have risen from the fucking ashes like a phoenix, the goddamn wolf, because I had lost hope in myself. Weighing that much, my hair was pretty much gone. You'll see this photo of me from a year ago that you wouldn't even believe that this is back. Like it was just gone from all the pills that I was forced to take. But, um, and then not being able to skate and all the pills, erectiles, you can't even fuck, can't even do anything fun. Yeah. So <laughs> I was just over it. I had no plan. And now that I can skate again, everything has changed. Now I want to prove to myself and to the people that if you lost hope and you don't think that you can change or get better, it's never too late because... I'm doing tricks now that I never could do when I was at my prime when I was 20. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, she has stretched my legs back to 100% again. Now the options are endless, and I want to keep skating. I mean, I fucking tore my ACL the other day because I found this ramp that was so rad in the middle of nowhere with Jake Wooten, and I was like, I got to get something cool here. Of course, my foot slips out. The other one lands on the board, takes off, and then I bend it backwards. Luckily, it didn't break because I've been stretching every day. And if that was the case, I'd be fucked. But I'll be <laughs> back in about two weeks. Nothing to worry about. Just a bunch of bruising. That's good. Pussy shit. That's good. That's good. Uh, if you need stem cells, let me know. We can take care of you. Are you serious? Yeah, we have the, we're the largest manufacturer of mesenchymal stem cells in the world. Uh, That's rad because Danny Way... Um, Everybody knows who Danny Way is. Guinness Book of World Records of longest and highest air at the same time, rock and roll. <laughs> but he went to Columbia okay. because he was so messed up that he has the Guinness Book of World Records of longest or, or most stem cells in his body. Yeah. And he told me that that it has made him feel 100% back. He had so many injuries from all the crazy shit that he's done that that he was in the same situation as, as me, yep. wondering if he'll be able to skate <laughs> again. But... Yeah. He had to keep going back too. It wasn't like it was a one-time thing. Yeah, he back and forth to Columbia. A one-time thing. Yeah, like, so Columbia, they, they do great work. It's Bioaccelerator. There's a place in Panama. Yeah. And then us, we're Cellular Performance Institute. And so I guess we're technically the three competitors, but you know everybody does really good work. And um, you know we'll we'll hook you up though if you ever need to you know to put some cells in you because um, it will. I mean, you know, yeah. if you got a torn ACL, yeah. As long as something is still attached, there's a good chance of doing it. And you would generally want to do it, you know as close to the injury as possible and okay. the body still is going in to heal, et cetera. Yeah. That gives you a better chance of, of healing the injury. Um, but, uh, yeah, we could have our doctors look at it and see if we can't, uh, help that'd be you. cool. Yeah. I, um, I leave to Texas tomorrow. So, I mean, if we have time in the day, that'd be great. We can hook y'all up, but, um, especially good, you know, my experience, you know, fighting and coaching, uh, I'm all beat up from yeah. all the years, uh, you know, and I mean, you took, way more of a beating than I did actually watching your old stuff on Jackass. I mean, it's like you've taken even more of a beating than, you know, than, than, than me or, you know, and, and 
most MMA fighters, <laughs> but it's still good to have something like stem cells to go back to, yeah. to, you know, get a little booster or, you know, uh, lower the inflammation and, uh, accelerate the healing. And, you know, that's what we're, we're really good at. I almost think I could say this, like, all right, we got motocross. That shit is gnarly, but they practice everything into a foam pit and get it wired until they could land it every try. Mm -hmm. So that helps them. Skateboarding, I think, is the most dangerous fucking sport <laughs> ever because the <clears throat> options are endless of what you can skate, and you could hurt yourself in every which way. You could rack your nutsack on a 13-stair <sighs> handrail, slide on your face, knock yourself out doing the loop, hit your tailbone on the side of a ledge you could get hit by a car after landing a fucking handrail trick yeah the options are endless of ways to get hurt so in my case i got 16 staples in the head broken tailbone eight broken ribs four broken ribs three broken feet two broken feet 15 broken wrists broken clavicle and um i've knocked myself out a baker's dozen of time yeah absolutely that's that's some wild shit man i mean <laughs> it's uh you know the intensity of that and you went harder than anybody uh, you know, pretty much in that. What's what do you think's like the the wildest thing you've done back in the in the jackass days? Was it on jackass or what, what's what's the what's the craziest um, thing you've done? I guess the most proud thing that I've ever done was the loop on a skateboard because I was the twelfth person to ever do it, and um, I was never really a vert skater, which is the type of skateboarder that would even try that to begin with. I mean, there's <clears throat> so many pros out there that have still chickened out to try it, and it took me three years to do it because the first time they built it was in orlando when we were filming for jackass so we had matt hoffman and tony hawk show up and tony hawk is already he was the first one and only one to land it th at this point so i tried it and i was landing in a foam pit and i kept doing it to the point where i could tape the mat away <laughs> and then try it but of course i fucking looped around like brian schaefer knocked myself out and then um went back for round two a year later at um Bob Burnquist's house, and then, because he built one, too. And, and this dude, Bob is so good at the loop that he was he, his phone was ringing at the bottom and he was at the top where you roll in to do the loop and he's like who is it and i read who it was and he was like oh it's somebody important i gotta answer that so instead of sliding down which he was contemplating <laughs> doing he's like oh fuck it he just drops in switch with a video camera in his hand Whoa. does the loop and then answers the phone i'm like you gotta be kidding me that should be the closing of your video part just because that was so off the cuff and incredible yeah I mean, he, he, <laughs> he had it down but i mean you, you said you're the 14th person yeah the the 12th or 13th, 12th. it was me and Jason Ellis who roughly did it at the same time, so we tend to argue about it. But then I showed up in Phoenix, Arizona to Tony Hawk Boom Boom Hawk Jam, and um, everybody has given me all this crazy advice of what to do, da 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 da, -da. Bob Berkowitz made it so simple. He goes, as soon as you roll in, don't even pump. Just let it take you where it takes you. As soon as you hit the transition of the loop, lock your knees, stare at 12 o'clock, and follow the stickers because there's a sticker line that goes like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so as soon, I said, okay, lock my knees, look at 12 o'clock. As soon as I dropped in, I did it first fucking try. Oh, awesome. What was so that's all you need to know. If you have the balls to try it, that's all you need to know. Lock your knees, stare at 12 o'clock, follow the stickers. It's not a backflip. It's more like a pause. <clears throat> What's it, what's it like, like going into, a, I'll call it stunts like that, or, you know, trying tricks like that, the mindset before, like, yeah. are you like, oh shit, oh shit, you know, you got, I got to go, like, what's, what is that like, what's playing through your mind as you're thinking about doing something like that? Like for me, whenever I was doing something gnarly that I knew would get the cover of Trans World or Thrasher or even <laughs> the ending of my video part, I would stare at it like months ahead of time and like prepare myself of when is the day I'm going to try it. Yep. And I know other so skaters you're visualizing do that too. Months ahead of time. That's, that's why it's so rewarding when you finally do it, just because it's been mapped out for so long. It's been a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. But man, these days, I think skaters are just so used to jumping on handrails and jumping down gaps that they just do it for breakfast. They show up to a spot, they see it, and they say, it's now or never. Because, mm -hmm. you know, here I am in nashville tennessee and if i find a rail today well i'm leaving to texas tomorrow so chances of me being back here are going to be years or never yeah. so i have to do it now and and that's been the case lately <clears throat> like i grew up when watching skaters 
salmon and gas switch ollied over a uh, fire hydrant, and I was so impressed that it was backwards. I'm like, he doesn't even skate that way. He skates goofy. He did it regular. What? Now they just do switch tray flips down 10 stairs like it's nothing these days. It's almost like playing the Tony Hawk video game yeah. and <clears throat> knowing that these tricks don't exist. But if you're a little kid thinking that they do, yeah. then maybe you could make it come to reality because that's kind of what's happening. Yeah, it's, it's pretty well. I've seen these manual combinations that are from the Tony Hawk game that are happening at the skate park right now. Wow. Blowing my mind. It's like the four-minute mile. You know, nobody thought it could be done. And then once it got done, you know, a lot of people started That's insane, hitting yeah. that. And, uh, you know, the mind is such an underrated thing when it comes to, you know, athletics and sports. Actually, anything. Success in life. Like, you're talking about visualizing months ahead of time. You know, that's that's exercise. That's yeah. exercising your brain. Going over and over. we we talk to our, uh, you know, cancer patients and the cancer patients, like their doctors are like, oh, don't worry about your diet. Oh, you don't have to worry about your mind. Oh, dude. It's like no, no focus on what needs to be done to have the best ability or potential to heal. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think it's an underrated thing. So like your mind, because you're seeing these kids now and it's still impressive. I mean, it's very impressive. Everything, everything they're doing. But, you know, you're kind of like a pioneer with the really, really crazy shit. Yeah. You know, you're going hard, hard in the paint. And so, yeah, I just wondered, like, what's it, like, how do you get the balls to actually, like, even, um, you know, 30 seconds before, you're like, I'm going to do it. Are you hy hyping yourself up? Like, what's, what's going yeah, on in your head? Um, I think I, you just think about how, like, um, you know, at this point, I was already the first skater to ride for Nike. I just got sponsored by mm -hmm. Element. Audio Shoes just picked me up when Tony Hawk joined. And uh, all these neat things were happening. I, I just knew that, you know, I said, a trick a day keeps the team manager away, which is true. <laughs> Look, I got a trick today. Leave me alone. Because <laughs> if, if you don't skate for like a week or you have no tricks to provide to the team manager, you might get booted. Or you might not be pro or somebody might be replace you in the line of becoming pro. You know, like this yeah. dude's been ripping harder <clears throat> than you. I know that you were next in line, but he's going over you because you're not trying hard enough. So that would be the motivation. That would be the motivation. Now, when it comes to jackass, you're allowed and it's recommended to sip on a little <laughs> shot of Crown Royal if you're going to get into a wheelbarrow and get pushed off a three-story roof into a fucking pricker bush because it's a <laughs> first-try thing. You're going to get the shot first try. You just have the courage to do it. Yeah. And, you know, having a couple beer muscles helps, but it does not help on a skateboard because... If you drink more than two beers, you are not balancing on a fucking handrail for shit. Right, right, right. Yeah, so the liquid courage for the jackass stuff, but... Uh, yeah, but you now know. it's a whole different story when you're 44 because in Jackass 2, when I was 25, I got high-fived for being drunk at the LAX airport with brass knuckles in my bag because... Island Def Jam just signed my brother to the label and they gave me a diamond gift that said Island Def Jam on brass knuckles. Didn't think anything of it. Chucked them in a pink bag with my iPod and I'm going through the airport on Friday night drunk. They're like, you have brass knuckles in the airport. I'm like, yeah, what of it? They're like, that's illegal in the state of California. I'm like, well, I'm from the state of Pennsylvania. How the hell am I supposed to do that? They're like, have you been drinking? I'm like, can't say that I haven't. I'm like, look, they're $20,000 brass knuckles. Just keep them because I got to get to Philadelphia. They're like, you ain't going nowhere except oh, jail. So because the movie was coming out and I'm all over the news, they're high-fiving me for good press. <clears throat> now I'm drunk out in front of a um, hotel in Santa Monica and it was on TMZ, and they consider me a liability now. Mm -hmm. But at 25, high five, good press. Press knuckles, drunken wasted at the airport. 44, yeah. liability. Doesn't make sense. Hypocrites. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, different eras, too. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the 2000s, kind of like a, a rock star era, um, yeah. where, you know, that, that type of stuff was, was praised. Yeah. Now they're just looking for reasons to cancel people. And, you know, maybe it wasn't right. Uh, you know, or them celebrating that back in the day, you know, and, and now, uh, you know, saying it's a liability, but maybe they realize too that, hey, you know, we can't build a, you know, I mean, organization I admit, this way. Is what made me or helped make me stop was, um, well, you know, like when I got out, I was so bitter to begin with. Yeah. I'm just getting suckered in and, and sabotaged of a, Hey, do you want to go to dinner at your favorite restaurant? Yeah, sure. I'll meet you all you guys there. And it's just a sabo of an intervention forcing me to go to treatment. So when I get out, I'm already 
I already know that alcohol is bad and it's not any good. Well, what are you going to do when you get out? I'm going to sip on a fucking White Claw. Why? Because fuck all y'all. So have you talked to, like, have you talked to any of those people? No, I don't want to. You want to. Never again, except for Steve-O, but I don't really want to talk to anybody right now just because I'm, I really, I've had such a big bubble for Viva La Bam that, like, I let so many friends in until my bubble just popped. Yeah. I didn't even know to answer the phone for who's important anymore yeah. just because I would give my phone number out to anybody who came in my path and cracked a joke and made me laugh. Yeah. Now I got Mr. Joke Cracker at midnight at the Blarney Stone calling me up trying to tell me more funny jokes, and I'm missing Danny Way and the shaman's phone call. You know, so now I have a very tight bubble. I would prefer to spend my whole day with Danny and the two dogs and call it a day unless we're in a new town and I haven't seen an old buddy for a while, unless it's a new skate friend that wants me to skate with. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's hard. I mean, and I can't imagine at your level, but, you know, when you do get famous, um, all the people that are constantly wanting, yeah. you know, uh, to contact you and to text and to you know, keep up. And it's like, you know, it's impossible. It's, it'd be impossible for you to actually, you know, uh, respond to yeah. everyone. And like, I honestly, my entire attic at Castle Bam is just filled with fan mail. And my grandpa was trying to answer as much of it as he could on his spare time, but he passed. But he's like, what are you going to do with all this fan mail? I'm like, there's so much, I don't know what to do with it, but I've been signing autographs since I was 12 years old. So when I'm just so used to it, and it doesn't bug me. I could be at a nice, fancy dinner, and somebody could interrupt me with a piece of fucking steak hanging out my mouth, and I would still be happy to take a photo. The only time I don't like it is when I'm at a skate park, because if one kid comes, then they all come, and they all want a photo, an autograph, and then to talk to their buddy on the phone because they don't believe I'm there. Mm -hmm. So if I say yes, I don't even break a sweat skating, and if I say no, then I'm a dickhead. No win situation. Yeah, it's a no win situation. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a t shirt that says, We'll sign and take photos after my sesh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's reasonable, though. Yeah. That's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, that's the hard part is, is people don't realize that you're, you know, like, let's say they're fans, but they don't realize that you're just a, a, another dude that's, hey, I want to get my skating in. Or, yeah. you know, if I were on the mat and people were trying to talk to me constantly, hey, I'm just trying to yeah. train, then we'll. We'll chat afterwards. So picture, you know, if you're on your 20th try trying a skate trick, you're already frustrated. So there I am trying to land it. I got Danny taking photos. I got another cameraman, another cameraman. And I'm like, oh, fuck, next one, next one. All right, next one. God damn, our next one, this lady just comes up and she's like, hey, would you mind walking down to the car with me? Because I got this guitar I wanted you to sign. And my daughter really wants you to. I'm like, really? Are you? Can't you see that I'm in the middle of something? What, what the? F How can you not read this one out? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm yelling <clears throat> the f word, and I'm trying my hardest to land this. Now, once I land it, I'm like hip hip array. Right. Please come up because I'd be more than obliged to sign your guitar. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's a. Uh... There's timing for everything. Timing yeah. is everything. Timing is everything. You know, I mean. And that was bad timing on her end. <laughs> yeah. So I hear you've been reading a lot, too. Yeah, man, because, you know, like I said, I always had an entourage <laughs> with me. And even at home, you know, I, the entourage would still be there. So there's never a peaceful time to read, even... At the airplane, I can't read if I'm alone because I'm constantly hearing flight to Milwaukee is at six o'clock, followed by Dallas Fort Worth. I can't, I can't. So, um, you know, Danny's doing her thing, whether it's cooking or, you know, being with the dogs or handling business. I'm out reading and I'm, I, there's so many books that I've wanted to read, just never found the time. And now we got a cabin up in the woods on the border of Kentucky with, uh, Yellow Wolf's manager, Ounce, and, uh, just been, Reading out in the woods and, um, you know, just because I got bookworm on my, my knuckles. Nice. <laughs> Followed by my credit card information. How long were you out there with Ounce? Um, about three days. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I, I love that guy. Yeah. He's a, he's a good dude. He, uh, he's got a great story, too. A lot of perseverance. You know, yeah. A lot of overcoming adversity. Um, you know, you are talking earlier about, you know, basically people seeing your life as an inspiration that they can overcome anything to come back. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's, what's that like, you know, knowing all the things that you've been through, but you know, like I said earlier, heads out of a cloud, but 
you know, moving forward? Are you nervous about slipping up? Are you very conscious? And um, are, are you no, really? No, hard? I'm not because every time I got out of treatment, I already knew that I was going to go right back to it. And I already knew that I wanted to do it knowing that it's bad because I didn't have any reason to not Yeah. now that I have skating back. I don't want to screw that up. I don't want to screw up yeah. my relationship with Danny because if, if I even relapse once, my dick will be chopped off. It'll be thrown <laughs> in the river and she'll be long gone. Don't it. need that. And for the sake of my son, Phoenix, who's six years old, yeah, he's the main reason. Well, but I mean, when, when, when it's a custody battle and I'm not allowed to see him that I, it forces somebody to drink. It's like, what do you want to do today? I want to see my son, but chances are I'm not because I'm 3,000 miles away. Yeah. And even if they said I could, I wouldn't get there on time. So what am I going to do today? Drink. So, yeah, <laughs> but you are putting things in place. For instance, like yeah. you're reading a lot. What, what's this thing uh, with uh, you're doing, uh, like studying astrology too? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just into, um, you know, all the astrology and uh, crystals, gems, and um, just shamanism <clears throat> in general. And even, you know green witchery which is like dealing with herbs mm -hmm. yeah yeah the uh you know the the shaman stuff has gotten pretty big you yeah know, it's, it's starting to come around have you ever done something like ayahuasca or yes well navid my shaman he's my best friend he's persian and he lives in escondido california but this dude has an answer for everything. Huh. He's a fucking wizard, and he cannot talk bad about anybody. You could be his best friend, and and then you just start stabbing him in the back, and he has 10 seconds to live. He would turn around and be like, I love you. Why? <laughs> Me, I'd be like, my best friend's the, you know what? You're dead, you son of a bitch. No, he'd be like, I love you. Why? And he does not look like he can fight it. He does not believe in violence one bit, but he's like, I could break your leg in one go. I, I show you 2%. I'm like, all right, 2%. He's like, boom. I'm like, oh, oh. he's like, that's just 2%. I'm like, I don't want to see five or God forbid 10. That hurt. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and um, he'll just have these zingers, you know, I'll ask him a question about something. And, and if I'm not ready to know it yet, he'd be like, you hang out with me for, or we be together for longer. I let you know, but right now, unearned wisdom is poison. Yeah. <laughs> like you, I can't just tell you. Like it's unearned wisdom. You you can't you can't start doing a kickflip if you've never even stepped on a skateboard before. You got to learn how to push an ollie first. No, unearned wisdom is poison. Where where is this guy at? He's in Escondido. Okay. Yeah, he, he's the best. He he. Uh, when I showed up. I was 250 pounds. He would hike me eight miles up a mountain every single day at 5 a.m. And if it was 5.01, it ain't happening. It was 4.59. He's still on time. Five o'clock. Boom, boom, boom. Let's go. Gnarly. That's awesome. Love it. What like, was, not even your, a was, minute off. What was your experience? Uh, like, like with ayahuasca. Do you have any okay, so or what? He does these 10 hour ceremonies and I've done about seven mm -hmm. with him. And, uh, he first of all it's harmala it's like this he mixes it with honey it's like a paste mm -hmm. you take that and then he plays some like mainly arabic music then you take three mushrooms don't know the milligrams and then after that you do shiawaska and then this thing called combo which is an amazonian yeah. frog that he burns about five holes in your skin and puts the oil in the skin, your face puffs up like a big red football. You barf out every tar yeah. and toxin known to man in about 20 minutes. You, your face, you look ridiculous, but in about 20 minutes, it all goes away and you feel like a million bucks. It's something that would take, you know, a month for or two to, for anybody to detox going to a GNC or seeing a doctor. This this combo <clears throat> shit, it, it's a 20-minute thing that would take anybody else months to get all that shit out. Yeah. I've heard it's uh, painful for that, you know. Yeah, well, I spot. mean, what's pain anymore? You know? Right. <laughs> the so, only pain that I get now is when people hurt my fucking feelings. Hey. Sticks and stones break people's bones, and names hurt me. That's right. But hey, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's human, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, shit. That's, 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 check that's, this out. So my, my, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but my neighbor Mark Hanna, when I was growing up, whenever. He would do something wrong. His dad would beat him with a belt or just give him a riot act for like an hour. So he did something real wrong. And he's like, oh, dude, I'm going to get the riot act for an hour. And I'm going to get beat with a belt. This is terrible. His dad walks in. He's ready for it. <laughs> and his dad was so disappointed. He said that this even hurt worse because he just looks him up and down. He goes, 
<laughs> and walks off. He's like, I'm like, so did you get beat? Did you, did you get a ride? I, no, he just looked me up and down and said, that hurt way fucking worse. <laughs> like, you're just so disappointed in your son. It's just like, it's not even worth it. It's just, it's not even worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's what drives a lot of people, man. You know, it's, it's disappointment. We don't want to feel like we're disappointing people. I don't, I can tell yeah. you that. Like even the, the callback thing we were talking about, I feel bad when I can't respond to everybody that's texting me. Yeah, I'm man. like, damn, because you know, you like, I, I love all my friends and all the people I've known for a long time, but there's only so many hours in a day Yeah, and it's hard to keep up with all the conversations. It is. And you know, that's the other thing, you know, you think 20 years ago, we didn't have, I mean, we had cell phones, but we weren't texting each other constantly. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like that. Cool. And, you know, Danny and I figured out that, like, having the cell phone constantly, it's like it it really interrupts the flow of everything. We, oh, yeah. We're sitting at a nice dinner, like a Ruth Chris steakhouse dinner. There was a family of eight sitting right next to us. And for 30 minutes, we both realized that nobody even talked to anybody. Yeah, they're, they're all on just phones. on their phones yeah. doing whatever they're doing. And it's like if we're we've been on a road trip all across America on this great adventure, and you know if she's on the phone and as I'm trying to jam the music, no, turn your fucking phone away. We're listening to the same song, looking at the same scenery, doing the same <clears throat> thing, and that's what makes it fun. Yeah. No, I mean we've lost we we've, we've become less connected uh, by being more connected to our phones. Yeah. You know, with everybody, it's yeah. like it's even weird for me to see my parents. They're like 70, 73. Uh, yeah. seeing them with their cell phones out, you know, on yeah. it, I'm like, golly, that's wild. You know, Man, like, I, I feel like, you know, if you constantly have your phone and you could play video games all day, like, you're never going to be forced to, you know, grab a piece of paper and start becoming a really great artist right. or something. If you always <laughs> have your Nintendo game in your pocket, then you're never going to be forced to deal with that boredom. And if this was the only... If I was in jail for... 37 hours and I'm in a white room and there's absolutely nothing to do at all <clears throat> except read that book. You know, damn well, eventually I'm going to pick it up and just start reading. Yeah. Whether it's, it's the worst book ever, I'm going to read it. Right. So, you know, nobody reads anymore. Nobody, everybody's just like, Oh, I'm bored video games. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's used to, to pacify the kids too. Hell yeah. It's like, yeah. here's, Here's an iPad, honey. Oh, well, Billy's whining over there. Just shove an ice uh, cream down his throat and give him a joystick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a a weird thing. And now, like, you know, back in the day, um, you know, we used to have like get tapes, you know, and it's like you know your old like skate tapes. And, yeah. Uh, we had used to have fight tapes. My buddy Scotty owns or uh, owned a company called OTM, and he was one of the first people to go to Brazil and film Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, live back in the day. Yeah. And, um, you know, he used to sell these sell these tapes, you know, and it's like, oh, we get to watch the jiu-jitsu on the tape. It was a big deal. Yeah. Um, probably like that with skateboarding, too. You get to get a hold of the tape. 100%. You know? It's like, you oh, got, shit, got the, we got the tape. That tape is in. Yeah, exactly. Let's play it. That was, now it's like, oh, I did. Somebody's tray flipped the love gap? Oh, yeah, it's on Instagram already. It happened 12 not even 12 minutes ago it's already online for all to see yeah no i loved waiting a year for I the video too, part man. to come out it was so exciting because you get this video you're like oh shit turn it in you're like oh, you watch it multiple times yeah you know over and over and over again <clears throat> and you know that's where you know now we get the instant gratification where it's on youtube <clears throat> it's on instagram you know you see it immediately so it almost loses its uh you know in many ways the excitement of of what just happened or what mm. they were doing you know yeah yeah, so um, I don't know if you know who, who uh, there was a UFC fighter in Adelaide, Australia. This was back in probably 2011. I'm drunk coming out of a bar in Adelaide. It's a college town, so it's very crowded. <clears throat> 2 a.m., I got a beanie on with like a cowboy hat, and I'm coming out, and I just hear somebody say, no stubble hat pussy or something like that. I didn't even look to see who it was, but I coughed up the biggest loogie and spit it right in his face. I didn't know it was a UFC fighter. Oh, I didn't know he was the number one champion, but boom, he knocks me out. And the cameras say that I was out for seven minutes. I wake up and everybody's fighting everybody. So I'm so discombobulated. I run over and I start punching you and you're like, dude, I'm on your team. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you are? Well, let's fuck him up. Yeah. And we start punching other people. Gunshots rung out. Next day, the news found out that I got knocked out by a UFC fighter. Like, man, what would you say to him now like thinking i'd be all man i'm like i want to thank him very much last night i slept like a rock <sighs> thank you slept good but i i believe his name was um paul P 
Paul Fleming. Paul and he was Fleming. a number one UFC fighter of lightweight in in um Australia. Gotcha. 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 Yeah, man. You never know <laughs> we who you're French. Oh, that. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you never know who you pick a fight with. You know, especially yeah. <laughs> these days. Some guys are doing Brazilian jiu jitsu, they and they're training <laughs> MMA and yeah. you know. <clears throat> and you can't fight nowadays like you used to. Like I used to love to fight. Like, yeah. Not in a bad way where I was trying to hurt people away, but you know, that was like that was you know, my whole life. But you know what? Like, like I took Taekwondo <clears throat> when I was younger for a lot of years and I became a brown belt. Um, and I, I realized that there's a lot of tactics that they teach you, but in a real street fight, like I feel like I'm not going to be waiting mm -hmm. to block your kick or block anything. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to hockey fight you until yeah. you knock me out or I knock you out. Yeah. You know, like I'm not going to, do any of that i'm just gonna go for the throat yeah i mean you know it, that's the best way if you're not extremely trained you know you yeah get, get, be as brutal as you can as yeah, fast just, as you can. it's dangerous all energy <laughs> just give it all up yeah. until you're going down yeah no, no doubt about it and a lot of the old taekwondo too it wasn't you know, there's like really solid taekwondo and then there's kind of like the the um, the weaker sport type so some of the stuff's yeah. pretty those guys out of korea were some vicious dudes yeah but um you know back in the day like 93 94 the first ufcs were coming out and so like when I, when I was growing up my parents didn't have a ton of money so we would uh i would i would go through the yellow pages they, they, they couldn't afford the the martial arts lessons so i'd go through the yellow pages and i i'd call the different schools a karate kung fu like, hey could you beat up this guy i just wanted to know like yeah. who could win in a fight like, if you were to <laughs> yeah. fight him they're like what i'm like yeah I'm just, is your kung fu better than that karate yeah. and so when the ufc came out i was like oh shit we're about to see what it is you know yeah. some, uh, all these different styles and then um you know the first ufc hoist gracie comes out and it's brazilian jiu-jitsu like yeah, oh he wow. was the man he was he like was. the tyson of you won every fight as far as I can remember. And then we filmed with Jackass. Chuck Liddell came up. I had the pleasure of getting punched as hard as he could into my stomach. Uh, it hurt like a son of a bitch. How did you do? Did it drop you? Uh, he dropped me. <laughs> and yeah. I had the wind knocked out of me for a little while. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I felt I was feeling pretty brave that day. Liddell was a bad dude. <laughs> yeah. Man. I used to love his his style was really interesting because you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't charge him. He would want you to come at him. Yeah. And he created these amazing angles to throw these punches, and he was just, you know, smoking and knocking yeah. people out. The only time I remember actually him knocking somebody out going forward was a guy named Babalu, where he was just blasting away, and then threw the switch kick that was pretty incredible. But, you know, for the most part, he was a great counter puncher. And then as his career went on, he started to lose his chin yeah. because he'd been in some wars. And, you know, you start, the older you get, the more you get hit in, in the yeah. jaw, you, you can't take the same punch as you, you used to. But uh, he's one of my favorite fighters ever. I, I, I got to say, man, I got to give it up to Conor McGregor because he talks so much shit yeah. that it makes me tune in when if, if I have something else going on, like, man, I'm going skating today and I'm going to do this. Uh-uh. Yeah. This dude has talked so much shit that I have to watch this now. Yeah. Whether he wins or loses, he has got me so excited That's to Connor. come out and watch this because he's just a nonstop shit talk. Oh, you have no idea. You hop into a room. Mm. I will do, 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 do. And it's so funny. Like, it's like, man, quick man if he loses, it's going to look real bad. But you know what? No, because I'm so excited to see this now. You have hyped it up that yeah. good hip hip array for you yeah now kind of changed the, the game with done. that man he yeah. completely changed the game you yeah know? he took it to uh you know just new heights and still he can still come back to the ufc you know i, I don't know how how good he is anymore um in the sense that he's, he's a great fighter but like you know if you're not training all the time year round and yeah. you got all these killers that that's all they're doing and you know you're off for six months kind of you know doing movies or whatever else he's doing um yeah you know, you're not going to be keeping up that super super high level uh, and you can go back and still be a high level fighter, but it's like to, to be at that tip top. I mean, this guy, Connor's fighting like killers now. Like, yeah. So it looks people like, Oh, well, you know, it doesn't seem like he's, he's doing as good as he used to. He's like, well, he used to do nothing but train. Right. And now he's, you know, living his best life on when he's, when he's not training. Yeah. You know, off so. the coast of Spain, I hear he's there a lot, but <clears throat> when he broke his leg, yeah. um, did he fully recover from that? My understanding is yes. Cool. My understanding is Yes. Uh, he's, he's talked about, uh, I believe like running for president in Ireland. They were, they were Dude, throwing you know some crazy what? laws out there. Yeah, Conor man. McGregor stepped up and said, Hey, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're going to take back our country. They were good for him. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. would be crazy. President McGregor. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know what? He Bono's so loved in in Ireland. I yeah. feel like whatever he decided to do or say, you know, he could win over the people. Yeah, no. you know, as, as as long as you, you know, are if you have a good idea and you're well known and people follow you, you never know. I mean. Shit, Kanye tried to run for president. Don't know if his bipolar ass, just like me, I'm bipolar as fuck, apparently. But, yeah, him running for president, he'd be all over the place. Yeah, he would, he would be a, an interesting president. <laughs> all over the place. But, you know, like a lot of these guys, like, you know, Trump was a populist candidate. Um, and, you know, has, uh, you know, I don't, we don't have to get into what we think of him. But, you know, it, the the popularity obviously helped. Yeah. And so something like Connor, you know, if if you can get in that position and you're actually trying to do what's right, yeah. what's best for the people, yeah. you know, that could be the best type of president or the best type of leader. For sure. Because we're all wanting people that we can trust and say, you know what? I trust the guy. Hey, you might screw things up, but we know you're doing your best. We know that you're not crooked. You're not taking bribes. Yeah. You're not doing those type of things. And <coughs> yep. um, I think that's what we're all kind of longing for right now. Is- yeah. And a lot of people want to embezzle or pocket some money or take some shit by the side. That motherfucker has so much money that all he wants to do is fix the country. Right. He's not trying to pocket anything. He's not trying to fucking no. That's a great idea if his idea is good. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> that's that's the thing. And yeah. um you know it'd be interesting because of the internet and because of the connection that we're talking about with the phones, um, you know, people can get pretty famous fast. They get a you know one viral video and Hell now they're yeah. well known. Technology has gone berserk. Are you following this AI <laughs> stuff at all? Like all no, that. but Al's is, and well, I was asking it the craziest questions, but but um, uh, no. As a matter of fact, when when a stripper stole my cell phone, <laughs> uh, I, I guess I don't even remember the codes to any of my Apple ID passwords or any of that. So I don't have Instagram, I don't have Spotify, I don't have the internet. I I have to use somebody else's phone for it's that. Kind of nice. It is. Yeah, it's kind of nice. <laughs> I realized that I don't hate it. I'm like, you know what? Everybody's always on their phone. I like to just live the moment. And, you know, right now, if I had my phone, I'd be like, oh, one, one second, we're going to answer my buddy. Yeah. No, stop interrupting the flow of everybody else's day and put your fucking phone down. Yeah, man. Well, you know, it's <laughs> it's weird. I Hopefully we'll have like a renaissance because it's, you know, it's getting to a point with the phones. Uh, most of us, I can tell you, me, I'm addicted. Yeah. I'm like on my phone and... You know, it's easy to just scroll mindlessly. Yeah. And I noticed my memory not being as sharp as it was. And I was like, huh, I got to really watch this because, you know, what is that doing? You know, is it, is it programming our brains to think a certain way? Am I yeah. living in an echo chamber where it's only my views yeah. that is the right views and it makes yeah. everybody else wrong? You know, what's happening right now with this, uh, you know, w- with the messaging that's coming into me? Well, I'm not saying this is any good, but check this out. So... Kim Jong-il, North Korea, Mm -hmm. found out that he likes sports cars. So I shipped my purple Lamborghini to Pyongyang just to see what the hell is going on. A few other um, dudes from the Gumball Rally shipped their Lamborghinis too, or Ferraris, whatever. And um, so what happened was we land at the airport with the plane, with the cars in the plane. They, we put it all lined out so he could take a look at them. Now, we can't drive them through town or anything. We cannot have them leave the airport. But we all to put our cell phones in a locker because when we go into town, he did not want any of the people seeing the devices that were on. Right. He wanted to live in the 50s or 40s or whatever they're at. Yeah. But, man, we hopped into a bus. They took us to the pretty much one and only hotel that was somewhat nice. And... I was allowed to bring my skateboard. So uh, these people were like, who in the fuck is this tattooed white dude on four wheels with a piece of wood ollieing over plants on the way down the street? Their their mind was already boggled. Like they could, they thought that I was from the future. (laughs) Then when six o'clock happens, picture a city nearly as big as Nashville, all the power goes out at six o'clock at night. It looks like Zombieville, very spooky and scary. Just a dim, dim, dim generator light in the hallways of the hotel, so you can see. But other than that, there's no street lights. There is, it's just black, very scary. Wow. But um, I'm glad that I went. Do I want to go back? Don't think so. Do- but man, they only have one TV channel, and it's whatever Kim Jong Il wants them to watch. Really? D- yeah. Did you uh, uh, get to meet him? I sat on the same like table as them, but I never like kicked it. I, it was just like a whole big long table that, that I was sitting 
with him at. Wow, when when did you uh, go? This was, I'm going to say like 2010. 2010. Yeah, it was the gumball around the world in eight days. So wow. um, there, there was a, quite a few of us that went. Yeah, that's before. But um, that's before Trump. And, you know, a lot of people. Oh. No wonder my interventionist probably checked me off as schizophrenic because I would be telling these stories in Rio. This guy's saying he took his purple Lamborghini to Pyongyang, North Korea, to hang out with Kim Jong Il, and then Billy Idol cut the roof off of it, and <laughs> Iggy Pop played his wedding. This guy is such a schizophrenic. He probably doesn't even own a Lamborghini. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, is. Maybe he didn't do the research to find out that <laughs> it's all true. You can just type it on the interweb and see for yourself. Wow. <laughs> That's wild. So did you go anywhere else with your Lamborghini? Was it, was it just there? Or did you so I, I, I started in Philly, put it on a boat to London where it started. Then we drove from London through Brussels, Paris, then Vienna, then Budapest, put it on a plane. No, we drove from Budapest to Serbia. Biograd, put it on a plane to Phuket, Thailand, drove it to Bangkok, stopped in Sapporo, Japan, then Pyongyang, North Korea, then Anchorage, Alaska to get some gas, Salt Lake City, Vegas, car broke down there, got it to California, shipped it to Detroit, and drove to Pennsylvania. Wow. <laughs> Fucked up. All, uh, all over. <laughs> What's, you know... A lot of driving. <laughs> yeah, a lot of driving. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of driving. I so how was it? Well... It was definitely a lot of driving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got a ticket going 167 miles per hour oh, wow. in France. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're like, what did they say? You know why we pulled you over? Yeah, I was speeding. <laughs> speeding. Reckless endangerment. Not wearing a seatbelt. Passing people in the shoulder of an intersection. Oh, that was a shoulder? I just thought it was part of the highway. License and registration, please. I pull it out. I have gum stuck to it. They're like, look, your ass of the car is like hanging out. Can you go in reverse and put? I'm like, no, I can't because some dickhead ripped out my clutch doing a donut behind my back when they were loading it up. It was these jackass dudes called Dirty Sanchez from England that they were pulling a prank on me. So they ripped out the clutch. It wouldn't go in reverse, first, or second gear. So they're like, you need to back your car up. I'm like, car reverse, none. It yeah. ain't going to happen. Uh. They're like, what do you mean it doesn't go reverse? Every car has reverse. I'm like, well, this one doesn't. And it's been across the world in eight days, and this thing is fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's been in eight countries. Yeah. yeah that's wild, man. <laughs> what was your favorite place uh, that you've, you've ever traveled to? Well, landscape-wise... And just peaceful wise, I would say Norway. Mm. There's a place called Pulpit Rock that's a three hour hike to get up, and it's this cliff that just drops off the face of the earth a couple thousand feet, and you could see Fords for ages. Very awesome. Then there's another one called Trolltunga, which is a 12 hour hike. So if you're not going to leave at 5 a.m. to get started, then you're going to have to camp out mm -hmm. at night. But you'll be driving down the road. You'll cut a left and see a giant waterfall. It's just no big deal to have. There's so many waterfalls there that most of them don't even have names. Oh, you know, wow. you're like around here. You got a 20 foot waterfall yeah. over there. They're naming that shit. Let's go check out whatever falls. Yeah. There's just 100 foot waterfalls in wow. Norway that they don't. There's just too many. So landscape wise there or Iceland and New Zealand's very pretty. But, you know, um, Helsinki, Finland for the rock and roll bands and um barcelona or spain in general for skateboarding because everything is made of marble and they consider it an art form to scratch up the ledges so they don't throw you out you don't have to run through any police wow. or any security and um you know it really i lived there for two years went to every single city and spot i know where everything is and when i got back to philadelphia i was so prissy <laughs> about everything yo bam you want to go skating no because there's a crack right there and it's made of bricks and it's not marble like spain you yeah. know i got so prissy <laughs> do you uh you know you do you look back like when you were a kid did you think that you're going to be going to all these different countries did you ever imagine I always knew that I wanted to. It's funny because as soon as I saw a skateboard, I knew that that's exactly what I wanted to do. I was I was a pitcher for a baseball team in Little League, and I was really good at that, but I didn't want to do it. I didn't like the uniform. I didn't like being a part of a team. Uh, and, like, you know, if you're the goalie of a, let's say, a soccer team, if you miss the goal and you the team lost because of you, I don't need that kind of, you know, what do you call it like pressure no if i'm in a skate contest and 
whatever I place is whatever I am. And there's no team saying hip, hip, hooray, or you suck. That's why it's a one-man sport. You could dress and look however you want. You can rock as much flair. And and the options are endless of what you could skate. You could skate this fucking couch right here. You could skate the transition to that pool out there if there was no water in it. Love it. Yeah, so you, <laughs> so you, you saw it. So you, you, you thought, okay, I'm going to be going yeah, you know, so, around the world. Well, um, this dude was pushing down the street at my school bus stop when I was in first grade, and uh, he just had this Thrasher hip kit with this, like, suspenders like Steve Cavallaro and this crazy gear with cool-looking grip tape, and he's hauling ass, and he just ollies, like, over this manhole cover and just kept pushing. I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> so then I looked up skateboarding, and it was um, Tony Hawk in a contest. It, it was called the Savannah Slammer in georgia and um you know dressing with all the top dogs were there and uh i was just so mesmerized by it i would wake up skate before school get home skate until the sun went down mm -hmm. skate 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 <clears throat> all day long and i knew that here's the thing about me is i never had a plan b <laughs> i was going to be a pro skater or i was going to be a stunt man or both or I, either way i knew i wanted to be on tv as a pro skateboarder or some kind of funny stunt man and that's how cky and big brother created jackass but um i didn't have a plan b so when i quit school the first day of 10th grade the guidance counselor was like, so you're quitting school to become a professional skateboarder? I'm like, yep. And they're like, do you think that, and you think that that's going to work? I'm like, yeah, I know it's going to work. <laughs> like, how do you know it's going to work? I'm like, because I'm going right to California and I already just got sponsored by Nike. First one ever gets sponsored. One of the first Remy Stratton. And then um, from there, I was already on toy machine. From there, I got on element audio shoes, spitfire wheels, thunder trucks, the list goes on. And uh, I came back three months later with a red ferrari in the driveway and the, the guidance counselor directs traffic at the end of the day so you know he's like, you go to stop doo -doo -doo. and then he sees this red ferrari ferrari and it's just me going ah. that's funny <laughs> just because he, he put me down he's like skateboarding is a fad and it's going to die down in two oh, years man. and you don't know what you're talking about and you're going to be back here in two years digging in the dumpster for a peach pit and i'm like no i'm not because I have a plan A and I'm not going to stop until I get it or I'm dead. Because if you have a fucking plan B, then as soon as times get tough and you got to pay your rent or whatever it is, then you can fall back on plan B. All right, I'm going to get that nine to five job after all. And then I'll do skateboarding on my part time. Hopefully I'll still be sponsored. No, <clears throat> you got to skate, skate, skate and shut the fuck up and skate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the, the key to success. Skate or die. Skate. Is, is that consistent <laughs> nonstop? Yeah. You, you have two things. And I like to kind of think about what makes people successful mm -hmm. and you visualize what you want yep. and then repetition, you do it yep. again and again and visualize. And that seems like what you've done you know, yeah. throughout your, your career. Well, that's what I would do when I was younger. I, I, I would set a goal and I would not stop until I got that. And, you know, at one point, I was outside of my driveway at Castle Bam, and I'm looking at all these cars that I own. I got a fucking purple Lamborghini Gallardo, a blue convertible Murcielago, a fucking DeLorean, a 1929 old-fashioned Mercedes, an S55 AMG Mercedes, two Hummers, two Range Rovers, a Porsche Panamera, an Audi R8, and I'm like, I have no more wishes. Yeah. I ran out of wishes. So what do you want to do now, Bam? I want to fucking party, because yeah. who cares? Yeah. So I partied it up, and... What I was doing is pretty much when somebody says, yo, man, you're insane, you're insane, ha, ha, yeah, I'm insane, whatever. No, what I was doing is insanity because to wake up hungover knowing that if you drink a beer, you're going to feel better, and then if you have another one, you're going to feel even better, and then if you have another one, you're going to be drunk knowing that you're going to feel like shit the next day, and then you wake up feeling like shit, oh, I'm going to die, but if I have a beer, I'll feel better. It's the hair of the dog cycle that yeah. I was in for a fucking decade, which is called insanity because... I couldn't get out of this cycle. Yeah. Once I got out of the <clears> cycle and I found structure, which is what I needed, because I would get out of the cycle a lot, forced to in treatment. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out, no I, my boredom would take over. Yeah. And then I'd see that Irish pub across the street, and I'd be like, that looks like fun. Let's crack some more jokes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I mean, you've overcome a lot, man. And, uh, you know, your story, there's like so many different heroes' journeys in – your story. Mm. And I know it's inspired a lot of people and, um, you know, 
you can do a lot of good for people. You know, yeah. Uh, obviously, Danny's helped you tremendously. And hell it's, yeah, it's like been, now I, I just we want to do a fucking great adventure tour in an RV and just save the world or what we can of it tour. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to skate park. <clears throat> I meet skaters. We skate. She saved. We rescue dogs. We start charity. Fun. We just. Just a road trip, having a blast. Yeah, and 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 being you know, outward focused. Yeah, you know, I mean, I love the fact that like when people say, "Oh, that person wouldn't hurt a fly," like she literally would not hurt a fly. <laughs> you know, like yeah. she's like, "Oh, let me get this fly outside." Why? Just kill it? No, never kill anything. Yeah. I'm gonna put kill the fly. <laughs> yeah. Well, the idea, like you know, when in doubt, focus out. Like if you're having a bad day, like yeah. how many times you feel bad going to feed the homeless. Yeah, you know how many times do you feel bad doing good for others and right. being outward focused? Even or not? the smallest thing, like helping an old lady across the street, Absolutely. makes you feel good about yourself, yeah. knowing that you did at least one thing good. Even though it was a small little thing, at least you did one thing good. Like the first time Danny started stretching me, she pulled my leg up. She went, and one, two, three, good job. And yeah. I'm like, good job. I did a good. Cool, I yeah. did a good job. What'd you do today, man? Well, I did a good job stretching today, I guess. I, I kind of thought I just fucking laid there, but she said I did a good job. Yeah. My day is already doing good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Those, you know, positive words of affirmation, too. <laughs> you got to find, like, it sounds like Danny's also kind of like a coach, you know, with, yeah. with how she's she's getting you straight uh, with your stretching and your, uh, your schedule. But, you know, that's a, a thing, too, is figuring out what makes people tick and, you know, mm what motivates them. And for you, sounds like you like to help people. Maybe that's got you yeah. in trouble a lot because you're so, you got such a big heart. Um, it's like you want to do everything for everyone, yeah. but if it's in a structured way, that's also what can make you happy. Yeah. You know? And you know, I've learned the hard way that money lent is money spent. There's been so many friends that I feel bad or I feel like I should help them out. And they're, <clears> you know, they can't pay rent this month. And, 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 and. Yeah. Boom, I swear if you give me 20 grand, I swear, I promise I'll pay you back. No, you won't. Because yeah. if you don't have it now, that probably means you never will. And even if you did, you're going to have it in your hand and you're going to be like, holy shit, I have 20 grand. I can buy that neat used car that I always wanted. Or I could give it to Bam like I was supposed to. Used car, Bam, huh. used car. Fuck him. I'm yeah. buying a used car. <laughs> you know? Exactly. <laughs> money lent, money spent. Fact. Yeah. That's a, that's, that is true. Whenever I lend money, I don't expect to get it back. Yeah. And I don't care about feelings anymore. Before I did. Yeah. Yo, Bam, you think I could buy like 30,000? Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> get out of my face. Never call me again. Bye. Yeah. Don't have time. Fuck out. Yeah. Um, so anything else? I know we got to close this out. Anything you'd want to say before uh, before you leave? Yes. I want to say, because <laughs> everybody always wants to plug, I want to thank Black Rifle Coffee for helping me out. Yeah, you just want a paycheck. No, I don't want a paycheck at all. Curiosity Donuts, they're the best donuts. They're in Doylestown. They make them super fresh. They're only open on Wednesdays because all the other days they're closed because they're making the bread so fresh. <laughs> Pam, thanks for the uh, for coming by. <laughs> yeah, rock and roll. <laughs>